Sentinel-6, Michael Freiler, is all about water. Welcome to Vandenberg Air Force Base in Central California as we prepare for tomorrow's launch of the joint U.S.-European effort that will launch the next spacecraft to continue this legacy of monitoring sea surface height. I am Marina Jureka from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and I am your host today as we share details on the launch readiness of our satellite and the preparations that are being made for tomorrow's launch. This has been a true international collaboration among several agencies in a first joint Earth mission teaming NASA and the European Space Agency along with other partners the European Organization for the Exploitation of Meteorological Satellites or UMETSAT the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration or NOAA and the French Space Agency CNES and the European Commission this sea level scout will collect the most accurate data yet on sea level and how it changes over time for this news briefing, we are taking questions from the media via the telecon line. Press star 1 to get into the queue or via social media with the hashtag Seeing the Seas. As we are social distancing, I will introduce you virtually to some of the people behind the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich satellite and those preparing it for launch tomorrow. On our panel today, we have... NASA's Associate Administrator for the Science Emission Directorate, Thomas Zerbukin. Remarks from the General of the European Space Agency, Johann Dietrich Werner. ESA Project Manager, Pierrick Volumier. Tim Dunn, the NASA Launch Director for Sentinel-6, Michael Freilich. Colonel Anthony Mastelier, Commander of 30th Space Wing. SpaceX Program Manager for NASA Launch Services, Juliana Scheiman. The mission's NASA Project Manager, Parag Vaze of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Lastly, from Vandenberg Air Force Base, Weather Officer, Captain John Ott. We will begin with Thomas Zerbuchen. Welcome, Dr. Z. Well, I'm so excited to be here today and uh, to really showcase this great international mission. And uh, of course, what's on this mission because of our European friends is the name of our friend Michael Freilich. And here's what he said. Earth system science is bigger than any particular agency. It's bigger than any single nation. It's bigger than any single continent. And I surely hope because humanity requires it, that we make some significant progress in understanding it. With this, I'll ask for the first graphic. And of course, tell you that this mission, just like you say, Marina, is an international, global, in fact, partnership required to study our planet. And it, because it belongs to all of us, and this partnership here is very much aligned with what Mike Freilich passions Mike Freilich's passion has been because, of course, it was ocean sciences, both as a researcher, as a professor, and as the director for a dozen years or so of the entire Earth Science program at NASA. This mission will provide critical continuity for our knowledge of the rising seas, and it will help us better predict weather. No no one on the planet is not affected by these things. In many ways, the seas are an integrator of our past. The ice that has melted is in the sea, and it stays there uh, for a long, long time. So the Earth is an ocean world, and that's what makes it the blue marble. From space, we see one big ocean world, so over two-thirds of the planet. So studying these oceans, on the processes that actually, you know, shape them 
and fill them, you know, the, the process that fill them, uh, whether it's, uh, it's, you know, ice, melt, or other, is a critical function of NASA's science program. So to understand what climate change means for the planet or, or for humanity, scientists need to take a long view. And so what's exciting is that this mission is, is really a follow-up of 30 years of uninterrupted measurements uh, that of spacecraft that have circled the Earth, taking the data that are there. So Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich and its twin launched in five years, Sentinel-6B, will add another decade of critical measurements from that perspective. And it's just so exciting to emphasize yet again how we do this together, Earth's observations, we do this together uh, as an international community, and that makes us stronger, that makes these measurements better, and in fact enables a critical collaboration by the colleagues that are with me on this call. The next figure is one that I want to talk about uh, a little bit, and that is uh, Michael Freilich uh, with me uh, the last time I was here, frankly, sitting next to me because we launched ISAT-2. Remember, we talked about just now the relationship of melting ice and the oceans, and he was there at launch. That was his last launch. Frankly, he was in tears just before we took that image because his colleagues had set up the opportunity for him to write his name on that rocket, his last launch. And I just want to tell you how honored I feel and how it still moves me today that the name of Michael Freilich is in fact on this, on this uh, spacecraft today. And it's because of our European colleagues and the tremendous partnership and friendship that they have brought to this. And I'm just so excited to get ready as we go forward to launch this amazing investigation. Again, an important, perhaps one of the most important investigations we could do right now uh, on this planet. But equally importantly, an investigation that honors one of our friends, a friend who connected us and because of whom we sit here today. Thank you so much, Marina. And now we will have a message from Director General of the European Space Agency, Johann Dietrich Werner. Sentinel-6, Mike Freilich. This is a very important mission for us and a very important satellite because of several reasons. Of course, reason number one is with Sentinel-6, Mike Freilich, we will observe the sea level rise, which is a strong indicator for the climate change. And this will help us to understand the climate change and also to counteract. Number two, it is international partnership. We are working together here with the European Commission, with UMITSAT, with NOAA and with NASA. And this cooperation is important because only in that way we will have data which will also be accepted worldwide. And it will be part of the Copernicus fleet in the future. But there is a third aspect, and this is the name, Mike Freilich. Mike Freilich was a space science director at NASA. Unfortunately, he passed away. But because he was so important for all the Earth science activities, we named these satellites to Mike Freilich. So I hope that we will see very, very nice data from Mike Freilich satellite because this will help us really to understand climate change and to go further in our understanding of our world. Thank you so much, Mr. Werner. Now we will hear from European Space Agency Project Manager, Pierrick Volumier. Thank you, Marina. I'm very happy to be here the day before the launch of our uh, Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich satellite. So a lot of work has been uh, put into uh, bringing the mission to today. And uh, I would like maybe to show a few slides to show you how the campaign uh, evolved and then reflect a little bit on what the mission is about. On the 24th of September, the, uh, the satellite and all the material landed here in Vandenberg, sunny California. And immediately the team uh, took on the job to move the satellite further. We can move to the next slide. So it gives you a feel on uh, how things happen on, on the field. Yeah, here the fairly big container and the truck started uh, like 15 kilometers, uh, kilometers uh, right to the, 
the payload processing facility. And then if you go to the next slide, next, next slide, yeah. Finally, we could, uh, let's say, prepare our satellite into the clean room here. You see Sentinel-6 in a folded configuration like it will be in the fairing soon in the launcher. You also see two important things on the satellite. The black cone is uh, the heart of the of the system, is the, the Poseidon 4 altimeter, which is a new technology developed for this mission and that will really make a, a breakthrough compared to the, the historical mission we are trying to, to follow. On top, and Pahag will talk about it much more, you notice the uh, AMRC, the microwave radiometer developed by JPL. You also see that the people are wearing masks in the clean room. This is a demonstration on the COVID constraint we had to go through from March. And despite all these constraints, uh, we have managed to keep the schedule, bring the satellite in full operational way here in Vandenberg ready for flight. So I think it's a big credit to the flexibility of the people and uh, the, the, the collaboration between all the partners to, to achieve that. We can move to the next slide, please. Just as uh, Thomas said and uh, Werner said, uh, of course, Sentinel-6 is very much a collaboration project. It's, I think it's the first time ESA and NASA really collaborate in such an integrated way on an Earth observation satellite. And I wanted to just fully acknowledge the excellent collaboration we have had, not only with NASA, and we from the European Space Agency together with uh, UMETSAT and, and NOAA. And all this collaboration is established in the framework of the Copernicus program of the uh, European Union. And I think Sentinel-6 is one of the uh, satellites in the Copernicus fleet providing mission data and products to uh, everybody on a free and open basis. So this is uh, uh, I think an important uh, added value for, for the society. If we move to the next slide. This slide is like a, a summary of what Sentinel-6 is all about. We have been measuring sea level from space uh, since almost 30 years. And uh, this enormous amount of uh, measurements and processing is summarized in this curve. This shows the global sea level increase due to global warming we are experiencing and measuring so accurately from space. And, and this uh, sea level is even accelerating over the last five years. So in average, we have like three millimeters every year. Over the last five years, we reach almost five millimeters every year. So the melting of ice, the the increase of heat content in the ocean is really the cause of what we measure from space. These measurements started in the past from Topex Poseidon, followed by the JSON 1, 2 and 3 series. JSON 3 is still in orbit. And Sentinel-6 is here to bring continuity to these measurements. So we will launch and rejoin JSON 3 in orbit to, uh, to uh, fly together like 30 seconds apart on the same orbit to be able to compare the measurement. And then Sentinel-6A or Sentinel-6 Microfarlish will add at least five years to this uh, data series. And then as mentioned before, we have already a Sentinel-6B satellite that will again be launched and replace Sentinel-6A in orbit to add another five years to the measurement. So, Overall, we will reach like almost 40 years data record for, for this measurement, which is so essential to demonstrate that uh, the Earth is warming and sea level is rising. So thank you, Marina. Thank you, Pierrick. The mission's NASA project manager, Parag Vaze of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory will speak next. Thank you, Marina. Thank you, Marina. Um, as uh, sort of picking up where uh, Peric left off with uh, the journey of our satellite uh, development and now arrival and, and readiness for launch, uh, it's been a long way. Uh, you know, the, this is a continuity mission and an operational mission. Uh, so that has been our priority to uh, get the satellite developed. And, and launched on time. The uh, measurement performance, uh, of course, is a, 
a key aspect of this and uh, maintaining and improving that, uh, especially as we're uh, embarking on a decade or more uh, with this two satellite project has been very, very important. And the hundreds of engineers uh, and scientists across the world who have contributed towards uh, uh, this uh, satellite development uh, is, is really important uh, to be able to, uh, to reach this point today uh, that we're at. Uh, Peric mentioned about the, the main instrument, the, the uh, altimeter uh, that's being provided by uh, the, the uh, European Space Agency. On the NASA side, we're, we're providing three important instruments on this satellite. Um, the prime one for ocean altimetry is the Advanced Microwave Radiometer. Uh, we call it a dash C, stands for climate quality. Um, this is an important um, enhancement for the radiometer uh, on this mission. Um, our objective is to be able to provide uh, additional stability and calibration uh, throughout the life of the mission and to be able to do that very, very quick uh, so that we can get data out, uh, reliable data, uh, that uh, is uh, following that trend uh, the, of, of sea level rise, but also providing operational data uh, to the global user community as fast as possible. We also have an additional uh, instrument, uh, if uh, you can show the, uh, the next animation uh, that I have, uh, for, uh, that's called the uh, GNSSRO. It's a, uh, an instrument uh, that we're uh, providing as an opportunity to really uh, have some additional atmospheric data uh, that's measuring satellite signals uh, from the GPS constellation and also the GLONASS constellation and, and really measuring how those bend and change as they traverse the atmosphere. This tells us a lot of important information uh, about the temperature and humidity uh, profiles within the atmosphere and will really help the uh, weather agencies across the world. Uh, NASA is providing an additional instrument called the Laser Retroreflector Array. Uh, and this is one of uh, three instruments on the satellite that will help to uh, determine the position of the satellite very clearly. If you can um, roll the next animation as well. Uh, so this, uh, this shows the, uh, the satellite moving and we have a, uh, a set of uh, quartz cubes that are reflecting ground-based uh, uh, low-power laser signals uh, which are being received back on the ground and helps us determine the position of the satellite very, very precisely and, and helps us measure uh, the sea surface height to within a few centimeters. Uh, it's been a long journey here. Uh, the satellite's doing well, all the instruments are doing well, and the operations teams now are ready to take over and uh, uh, produce the data uh, and distribute it out to the global community. Back to you, Maria. Thank you, Parag. Next, we will hear back from Tim Dunn, who is the NASA Launch Director for this mission. And then immediately following Tim Dunn, we will turn it to Juliana Scheiman, who is the SpaceX Program Manager for NASA Launch Services. Tim? Thank you, Marina. I'm proud to be here today representing the women and men of NASA's Launch Services Program. I'm NASA's Launch Director for the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich mission, and I'm thrilled to be a very small part of this incredible team launching this critical international ocean altimetry satellite. After being away from the Vandenberg Air Force Base for a couple of years, the NASA launch team is thrilled to be back on the beautiful Central California coast and ready to launch another rocket. Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich is the third NASA LSP science mission to launch on a Falcon 9 and it will depart Earth from Vandenberg Air Force Base at Space Launch Complex 4, the pad we call Slick 4. I'd like to recognize the Falcon 9 Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich launch team. It's composed of SpaceX, NASA, JPL, European Space Agency, Airbus, and the United States Space Force's 30th Space Wing. This assembled group of professionals is world-class and a real joy to work with. I'm really proud that I can be on the same panel with Parag and Pyrrhic. Juliana is gonna come up next. Colonel Mastelier is gonna represent the 30th Space Wing. And just what a, an honor it is to have this team assembled to do this important work here from the Central Coast. 
So here we are in the midst of a pandemic and we're successfully executing a launch campaign. And that takes a lot of work. Due to COVID, we've done numerous things differently on this launch campaign than we would typically do. We've had to quarantine after travel. We had to reduce our on console footprint uh, by 50% so we can space out and be more socially distanced. We've implemented all the COVID protocols of temperature checks of our team as they enter buildings. We do frequent sanitizations and mandatory mask wear while on console. So we're all keeping each other safe. We can't afford to lose a single launch team member. Over the past month, the Falcon 9 team has been busy with our final launch preparations. Two weeks ago, we encapsulated the Sentinel-6 microfrylic spacecraft in its payload fairing. I'm gonna show you a video in a little bit about that. Then last week, we performed the successful mission dress rehearsal. And this past Monday, the combined launch team held the flight readiness review as a readiness assessment for a static fire event. A day later on Tuesday, the launch team performed a successful static fire and we burned the first stage engines for full duration of seven seconds. And that uh, told us that Falcon 9 is ready to launch. The team then returned the rocket to its hangar and just yesterday we mated that critical spacecraft asset, the Sentinel-6 microfrylic spacecraft to the Falcon 9 rocket. Now I'd like to show a video of the SpaceX crew encapsulating the spacecraft and then preparing the Falcon 9 launch vehicle. So here you see some stills in the SpaceX hangar's payload processing facility. Shows that beautiful payload fairing with that gorgeous Sentinel-6 decal on the outside. Here we are. This is a representation of what ha happened this morning at the Slick 4 hangar. This is actually TESS, a mission that we launched a few years ago from the East Coast, but it shows it moving out of the hangar. And I'm gonna go back a little further. This is actually our Jason 3 mission here, four and a half years ago from Vandenberg, but it shows the Falcon 9 translating out to the launch pad, going erect. There's the beautiful coast and the Pacific Ocean in the background of below Slick 4. And this was launch day for uh, Jason 3. And this is exactly what it's gonna look like tomorrow morning. Maybe we can do without that fog but uh, I'm gonna let the weather officer tell us about that coming up a little bit. So just this morning, we held both the NASA, SpaceX, and the 30th Space Wing launch readiness reviews, where we received approval from senior management to continue processing toward launch countdown tomorrow. As slick for today, uh, we did begin that process of rolling the rocket out, and I can now say that we have successfully exited the hangar and the rocket is at the launch pad launch deck and we'll be going vertical with it this afternoon. Early tomorrow morning, the launch team will arrive on console to perform final pressurization and vehicle checkouts. The launch team will be pulled for concurrence to load Falcon 9 propellants, both RP-1 kerosene and liquid oxygen at about 8.30 a.m. Pacific time. So after those propellants are loaded, and uh, we do follow that uh, by follow the RP-1 with the densified cryogenic liquid oxygen into both stages. We'll do a final readiness assessment and know that we're ready to launch. That launch time tomorrow morning is going to be 9, 17, and 8 seconds a.m. Pacific time. So set your clocks for tomorrow morning if you're on the California coast. Uh, a little bit later in the day, if you're on the East Coast. We're gonna have a single instantaneous window. We've got, got one chance to do this tomorrow and things look really good for us right now. So in summary, the Falcon 9 rocket, the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich spacecraft are both ready and the launch team is prepared and we're all excited to be here at Vandenberg poised to launch this very important mission for scientists worldwide. Back to you, Marina. You, Marina. Thank you, Tim. SpaceX Program Manager for NASA Launch Services, Juliana Scheiman, joins us now. Hello, Juliana. Hello. Thank you, Marina. Uh, well, first, I'd like to start by saying a big thank you to our customer, NASA, our partners at ESA uh, and the 30th Space Wing for their support ahead of tomorrow's mission. It's a real honor to be here today with all of you. 
SpaceX is targeting an instantaneous Falcon 9 launch tomorrow morning with a liftoff time of 9.17 a.m. Pacific for the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich spacecraft. Um, if needed, uh, we're launching tomorrow from Space Launch Complex 4 East here at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. If needed for any reason, we have a backup launch opportunity the following day with a different liftoff time of 9.04 a.m. Pacific. The rocket and the payload are looking healthy and we're counting on the weather officer to provide clear skies. No more fog from Jason 3. <laughs> um, tomorrow morning's countdown will be similar to previous missions uh, with propellant loading beginning approximately 35 minutes prior to liftoff. I think I have an image to walk you through the launch sequence. Thank you. Um, so following liftoff and stage separation, Falcon 9's first stage booster will return to land, will return to Earth, um, and land back at Space Launch Complex 4 here at Vandenberg Air Force Base. Um, the landing zone is adjacent to the launch pad. Also following liftoff and stage separation, Falcon 9's second stage will perform two burns to deploy the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich spacecraft to its intended orbit approximately one hour after liftoff. The payload and the rocket are, are looking super healthy um, and, and overall we're really excited about the mission. Uh, it's particularly exciting for me because uh, my first launch with SpaceX was the Jason-3 mission. And as you've heard from some of the team members on the panel today, the Sentinel-6 uh, spacecraft mission is a, is a content continuity mission from the Jason-3 in the series of Jason missions. So particularly exciting for me. Um, the launch tomorrow will be the first from Vandenberg since June of last year. Uh, June of last year was when we successfully completed our second land landing here at Vandenberg. Um, so it's been a while, but we have this is the start of many exciting things to come at Vandenberg. And we have a suite of very exciting missions. Um, so tomorrow is going to be a great day. So big thank you to NASA and the rest of our partners, and we're looking forward to launch tomorrow. Thank you so much. Everyone is looking forward to launch tomorrow. Colonel Anthony Mastelier, commander of the 30th Space Wing, comes next. Okay, thank you very much, Marina. Um, Listen, ladies and gentlemen, I am absolutely privileged to be part of the fantastic team, the lineup that you've seen here today. All the hard work that has gone into this culminates, uh, you know, tomorrow morning uh, at 9.17, like you heard. And I can tell you that all of Team Vandenberg, uh, the 6,000 men and women who represent Team Vandenberg, as well as the 30th Space Wing, we are absolutely thrilled to be part of this very, very important mission. Um, I can tell you that our customer, SpaceX, uh, a partnership that uh, we feel really, really good about and have had a great past and a promising future. And of course, SpaceX's customer, NASA and our European partners, um, all of the mission integration, the coordination leading up throughout this launch campaign, uh, during, as you heard from Mr. Tim Dunn, during a period of you know, global pandemic, unprecedented challenges, it's really remarkable. I am so impressed at the continued strong partnership uh, in working through these challenges and, and making sure that we can get to launch day uh, safely um, and responsibly. I can tell you for our part at the 30th Space Wing, it's all about providing a green range, right? Um, this is an air, a, a place, so what, so what does that mean? Uh, from a range perspective, uh, for one, uh, we're, at, we're an attractive location geographically. Um, as you know, you can fly south from Vandenberg and pretty much you don't hit any land until you fly over Antarctica. So it's a very safe corridor for the polar launches, uh, perfectly suited for the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich mission, um, and uh, we're really pleased to be part of it. Um, but as part of the range, our responsibility is also to make sure that all of the infrastructure is ready to go to support our customers. Everything from the roads, um, electric, water, um, making sure that necessary commodities are available um, so that our customers have everything they need to be successful on launch day. 
Uh, of course, that starts well before launch day and it involves working very closely with our engineers. It involves working very closely with our safety representatives who look at every single possible uh, failure mode to ensure that no matter what happens on launch day, uh, we can maintain safety, public safety here in the Central Coast. Um, and that's one of the primary missions of the range is to ensure that we can provide a safe place to conduct operations. And that of course requires a lot of coordination, not just with other services, uh, but with other uh, agencies and, and, and deconflicting airspace, uh, area clearance, ensuring that we have all the necessary uh, evacuations uh, in place so that we can ensure a safe flight for the Falcon 9 as it climbs uh, into its required orbit. Now, in addition, we do provide a, a good deal of instrumentation here on the range. SpaceX uh, is a great partner. They, they bring a lot of their own instrumentation. In fact, they have, a, they have a sizable footprint, but we also maintain instrumentation to enable us to do that, that emergency response mission if we need to. Um, Finally, uh, I would like to give a shout out to our local community uh, because we can't do this here at Vandenberg alone. And we work very closely with the city of Lompoc, with the county, Santa Barbara County and the sheriff's office, uh, with the state of California and the California Highway Patrol in the weeks uh, uh, and, and months leading up to this, this event. Uh, so that we can make sure that everything is in place and ready to support this mission. Um, in, in summary, if we do our job right, our customers can worry uh, and focus their attention rather on their important job, which is getting this satellite up into orbit to perform its extremely important mission. So we're proud to be part of the team and, and absolutely looking for an outstanding day tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Colonel. And of course, now all eyes are on the skies as we look for the most important weather forecast. It was a beautiful, crystal clear, sunny day when we all woke up this morning here in Central California. But we know that the rocket cares about what's happening in the upper levels of the atmosphere. So here to give us the critical weather report is Vandenberg Air Force Base Weather Officer, Captain John Ott. Thank you. So weather along the Central California coast this time of the year typically involves high pressure with the occasional cold front that will bring some gusty winds in the afternoon. Currently, California is experiencing a mix of high pressure systems both inland along the Great Basin as well as over the Pacific Ocean, which is bringing us pretty much fair, pretty fair weather. However, aloft, we have the jet stream going through the state, which is bringing winds uh, strongly out of the west at 90 to 105 knots. Moving over to the satellite image that we have for the state, we can see that that high pressure is bringing some high level cirrus clouds over the area. Moving on to our primary forecast day slide, we can see that high pressure is dominating the region. Visibility at T0 will be unrestricted. Winds will be out of the north at eight to 12 knots with maybe the occasional gust up to 16. Temperatures will be in the mid to upper 50s. The overall probability of violation at T0 will be due to ground winds and that'll be 20% South Launch Agency constraints. Going on to our scrub forecast day, it is much the same. Uh, high pressure will continue to dominate. Visibility will remain unrestricted. Winds will be out of the north 8 to 12 knots. Temperatures will be in the mid to upper 50s, and the overall probability of violation at T0 will remain at 20% due to the launch agency constraint of ground winds. Thank you. That is all we have for weather. Thank you so much, John. We are now ready to take media questions. Remember to press star one to get put in the queue and please direct your questions to one of the panelists that are here with us today. We're also taking questions through the Seeing the Seas hashtag. We have our first phone call that comes from Stephen Clark at Space Flight Now. Good afternoon, Stephen. Hi, thank you for, uh, for doing this. This is Stephen Clark, Space Flight Now. I believe my question is for uh, Colonel Ma uh, Mastelier. This is the first uh, orbital launch from Vandenberg in quite some time uh, since last year, I believe. Uh, just wanted to, uh, you know, 
get your thoughts on, on some of the activities uh, maybe during this down or quiet period, at least in terms of launches, what's been going on at Vandenberg in terms of, you know, attracting new customers or infrastructure upgrades. And uh, also, can you preview, uh, you know, after this mission, I think you have some more launches later this year, early next year. Can you just walk me through uh, sort of your, your manifest and missions coming up for the next few months? And quickly, if I could, for Tim Dunn, uh, can you provide the exact launch time for Sunday if necessary? Thanks. Sure. I, I'll, I'll take the first piece. Um, so a, as many of you probably know, Vandenberg, in terms of our capacity as a range, uh, we have many customers, not just space launch, but of course, we also do a, a lot of testing uh, for Global Strike, uh, the Minuteman 3 weapon system tests here at, at Vandenberg Air Force Base, uh, missile defense agencies, ground-based interceptor tests here. Uh, so we have been continuing the the tempo, the test tempo uh, has been fairly regular uh, since our last space launch. Um, and that's good because that keeps the range crews, keeps their expertise honed, uh, making sure that they're ready to procedures. Uh, although each procedure uh, and set of procedures is tailored uh, for the, that particular mission, um, in, in aggregate, uh, the same skill sets apply across, you know, running various functions on the range. Uh, so we have been very busy with that. And in addition, you alluded to this, um, we, are, we are working very closely uh, with the state of California um, and uh, Cal Poly University and some uh, non-federal entities uh, such as REACH, which is a, a regional economic uh, action coalition. Uh, to explore the possibility of uh, creating kind of a, a commercial zone here at Vandenberg. Um, and, and we believe, you know, of course, it, it, the federal government and the Department of Defense uh, believe strongly that competition um, is very, very important in the space launch industry. Um, and, and that will benefit all of us uh, in the long run. So we're doing what we can to facilitate uh, commercial space lift and, and the gro growth of commercial space zone here at Vandenberg. Um, I guess, uh, finally, in terms of what's coming up next, uh, of course, we, we have a Delta IV Heavy on the manifest um, that will be com coming up in the next few months. Um, and another uh, commercial company that we have a partnership with uh, here is Firefly, and they have uh, a booster, they have flight hardware here on the installation and are working toward a launch date, hopefully in January. Um, so we continue to talk to new customers uh, all the time about the possibility of launching at Vandenberg and utilizing our facilities. Uh, and we're excited about the future of commercial space lift uh, as well as national security space lift. It's a, it's a very promising future here at Vandenberg. Thank you very much for the question. All right, and I'll take the question from Stephen about the time for our backup day. First, I want to thank Colonel Mastelier. Earlier this week, we did not have approval for a backup date for the this mission, and uh, Colonel Mastelier and his scheduling team worked very well with our neighbors to the south of Vandenberg, the Naval Air Warfare Center. Uh, so our friends in the Navy, we were able to work with them Colonel Maslier, your team did a great job. We're now approved for the 22nd of November as a backup date, should we need it. And Stephen, that T0 would be 9.04 and 27 seconds a.m. Pacific time. Thank you for that, Tim. Our next question comes from Elizabeth Howell at space.com. Good afternoon, Elizabeth. Good afternoon. This one will be for Tim. So you had already alluded to the newer procedures that have been put in for COVID, and I just wanted to get a sense of how all the teams are doing, you know, in terms of their uh, their workload and also their uh, emotional uh, situation. How's everything? <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a very insightful question to ask. Uh, so as you can imagine, some of our team has been here on the Central Coast uh, for a while now. Our spacecraft team has been here uh, for a couple of months now. And, and there are worse places you can be than being trapped on the central coast of California. It's a wonderful area. The 30th Space Wing are tremendous hosts to us. Uh, so I would say in general, the team has really come together 
Uh, not everyone has been here two months. Uh, I've been here almost a little over three weeks now. Uh, I do look forward to returning home at some point in time, but it's really nice to come together with the team uh, and, and to know the importance of what we're doing. And it really does energize us and give us uh, the necessary uh, energy to continue to press forward. Uh, we put all of those COVID protocols in place. And as you can imagine, one of them is taking out one of the most popular things that a deployed launch team can do. And that is frequently dying together each evening. We know we work hard. And so we kind of like to get together in the evenings and have a share a meal together. And we've lost a lot of that uh, due to COVID. But we found other ways for the team to come together in a safe environment, uh, outdoor activities, outdoor patio gatherings. Uh, but I would say morale, especially when we're this close, morale is really high. And I'm so proud of just the entire team, uh, Parag and Pyrrhic and their, their spacecraft team, uh, interfacing with the SpaceX team and watching them do the amazing work in these challenging circumstances. I'm really proud of the team and we're ready. We are ready. Thank you so much, Tim. Now we're going to our social media questions. If you have a question for our panelists, make sure that you use the hashtag seeing the seas. Our first question comes from Srini Mohana on Twitter asking how many satellites will be launched from NASA every year and how many are already there in space? Dr. Z, would you like to take that? Oh, I'm excited to talk about that. I'm so glad about this question because the answer is really exciting. So of course the answer, it depends on the year. So this year, if you paid attention, you already know we already went to space with a Mars mission. It's already over halfway to Mars and we're gonna land in February there. We have this mission now, but next year, currently we have eight different launches uh, going to space on our plan eight different times, eight different rockets will go lift the earth and, you know, punch that hole in the sky and go up. And how many are in space right now? We have close to 50 spacecraft, big spacecraft in space and, and just about 20 or so small spacecraft in addition to that. So, so those are the spacecraft that uh, all have NASA labels on it. If asked our European colleagues, they have their own set of missions. And then of course the Japanese, uh, other countries as well. But for NASA, it's about that, that number, Marina. Thank you, Dr. Z. Carl on Facebook asks, how do you maintain Sentinel-6 orbit so precisely and how do you know where you are? Parag, would you like to take that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, really, really great question. Um, so uh, first of all, as we're orbiting the Earth, uh, you know, we're going about seven kilometers per second. So we're going really, really fast. And a key uh, uh, item that we need to know in terms of being able to make this measurement is where the satellite is precisely to within, uh, again, centimeters that we have. And we have three sets of instruments on the satellite uh, that really help us uh, uh, determine our position very accurately. Uh, one one system is uh, a GPS receiver, uh, that's a, or GNSS receiver that that uh, uses a similar system like uh, other people might have on their phone and other uh, equipment. But uh, again, since we're traveling in space, we need uh, a really high performance system uh, to be able to do that and determine our position to within centimetric kind of accuracies. We also have a, a, another instrument called the Doris instrument, which is sort of a, a set of ground-based beacons providing uh, a signal back up to the spacecraft. And we're using kind of a similar principle like GPS, but uh, uh, helping to uh, use those radio signals to figure out exactly where the satellite is. And then we have the laser retro reflector as well. So we really have a combination of three systems. We have three because this is such an important measurement uh, to really perform uh, the altimetry sea surface height measurement uh, with that sort of precision and accuracy. Thank you, Prague. And now we turn to the phone lines. Irene Klotz from Aviation Week joins us now. Good afternoon, Irene. Good afternoon. Um, I was wondering if somebody has a mission cost and what the uh, share was between uh, NASA and European, not including launch costs, 
And then I have a follow-up question about the launch cost. Thomas, would you like to take that? I'm happy to answer that. The total cost of the NASA contribution uh, for both spacecraft, remember we talk about uh, Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich and Sentinel-6B, is of the order of half a billion dollars. And uh, I'm told in a previous uh, presentation by a my European colleague who uh, works at the European Space Agency, my good friend Josef Aschbacher, that the contribution from Europe is about approximately the same number, just as an order of magnitude. Those are the numbers. And um, when the uh, NASA Launch Services Program awarded the flight contract to SpaceX, I believe it was for 97, um, 97 million, and just wondered if that number is still good or has that gone up or down? Sometimes I know they go down with booster reuse. Thank you. Hey, Irene. So I can tell you that when we awarded the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich mission, we were scheduled to launch on the 15th of November of 2020. And here we are about to launch on the 1st of November 20. So there has not been any significant delays that would have driven up any of our uh, launch service costs. So that uh, $97 million full launch service price that uh, we acquired the Falcon 9. That also includes more than just the hardware of Falcon 9. It includes us uh, paying SpaceX to take care of our spacecraft in their payload processing facility for a couple of months prior to launch and a few other things. But that number is still valid, $97 million. Thank you for that information, Tim. Now we're going back to our social media questions with the hashtag Seeing the Seas. Luis on Facebook asks, how high is Sentinel-6 orbiting? Tim, would you like to take that? <laughs> oh, I, I could take a stab at it. I think Parag, I'm gonna turn it over to Prague. It's around 1300 kilometers, but Prague, I'm gonna turn it over to you for that exact answer. Sure. Sure, yeah, uh, it's, it's 1,336 kilometers, um, uh, about 800 uh, miles up in the sky. So uh, it is the exact same orbit as uh, our prior missions, uh, the, the Jason series of missions are following. So we're, we're planning to launch right into that uh, exact orbit, 1,336 kilometers, uh, and uh, uh, basically continue uh, this mission going forward following uh, the, the Jason series of missions that are already up there. Thank you for that, Parag. Now, Fernanda on Facebook would like to say hello from Germany, so thank you for tuning in. Will you collect data about the climate change above rivers like the Amazon? Pierrick, would you like to take this? Yes, thank you, Marina. Thank you for the question. Uh, indeed, uh, the sea level are measured from space, uh, but uh, with the new technology we are developing, the altimeter is getting more accurate and uh, the African sea radiometer we are using uh, allow to also start measuring the, the level of rivers, large rivers and lakes. So indeed, this hydrology aspect of the, the altimeter mission is now a new topic and uh, will develop in the future. Our colleague at NASA are busy with uh, SWAT, and we are looking into making this ideology type mission operational uh, in, the, in the near future. Thank you, Eric. Avenue Valencia on Twitter wants to know, how is this satellite different from previous sea level monitoring satellites? And I will toss this over to Prague. Okay, yeah, um, it's, uh, it, you know, our job is to do two things, is continuity on one hand, uh, so uh, that's very, very important for us to be able to establish that and uh, do, uh, do at least as good as our predecessors are, but really we are trying to do even better uh, than, uh, than what's happening right now with the Jason series of missions. Uh, Pyrrhic describes the, the, uh, the main instrument, the, the altimeter that uh, ESA is providing. It's a, a significant enhancement 
uh, in, uh, in many of the features that the uh, main instrument provides in terms of uh, uh, measurement accuracy, uh, resolution, getting much closer to the coasts. Uh, the NASA radiometer um, is, uh, is very complementary to that uh, goal of, of being able to provide higher resolution and uh, get much closer to the coast as much as possible. Um, we uh, have been measuring the open ocean uh, uh, over the last uh, uh, 20, 30 years uh, with these series of missions and uh, we're trying to of course continue that but even get closer uh, to the coast uh, and uh, uh, help to inform the, the hundreds of millions of people who live along the coast. Really interested, my colleagues here. So this looks like a little house are there other spacecraft that look like this in this uh, series of heritage spacecraft in Europe or in the U.S.? Pierre, do you want to take that? Yes, indeed. The, uh, the, the form factor of Sentinel-6 is a little bit peculiar. Um, it has got to do with the uh, orientation of the solar panel we need to maintain on uh, this very particular orbit. Most of these satellite orbits are normally synchronous with the sun, so you get the sun always from the same direction, which is not the case here. So uh, we've decided to not have any moving part on the spacecraft, so having fixed panel and therefore to cover all direction, we have this kind of roof shape, uh, uh, let's say, or, or arrangement for the solar panel. This is also fitting very well into a fairing. So this is why you will find similar shape, for example, in the very well-known spacecraft here, the, the Grace and Grace follow on uh, series. Yes, I agree. It does look very much like uh, a little house. Sometimes people say that it looks a little bit like Snoopy's house. So, <laughs> All right, now we have another person on the phone. We have Stephen Clark from Space Flight Now. Good afternoon, Stephen. Hi, thank you. Uh, my question, I think, uh, might be for Juliana. Um, I think you have two launches from different coasts this weekend, uh, tomorrow, and then potentially Sunday night. Uh, from uh, here at Cape Canaveral, uh, any concerns or any any uh, requirement to have a certain amount of spacing between two different launches from two different pads from a SpaceX perspective, and you know just how busy will the team be this weekend? Thanks. Thank you for the question, Stephen. I appreciate the opportunity to address that. So we have, as you mentioned, there are two uh, launches that are currently there's the Sentinel Six launch and a launch. A Starlink launch. So those are our SpaceX satellites. Um, the most important launch happening is the one for our customer NASA, and that's the Sentinel-6 mission. And so we will be uh, prioritizing the Sentinel-6 mission accordingly. And if needed, we will hold the Starlink launch. Um, right now, the Starlink launch is scheduled for Sunday after our uh, Sentinel-6 launch. Thank you, Juliana. And we have one last social media question from Hussein on Facebook asking, what is the difference between the Jason missions and this mission? And Parag, you talked a little bit about this already, but maybe you could also talk about how close they'll be in orbit position. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good point. Um, you know, one of the uh, uh, objectives, again, when I was saying about continuity, is being able to have um, uh, being able to compare how well uh, our, our newest satellite does and, and be able to, to uh, look back at the 20, 30 year record that we have uh, backwards but and, and then of course going and, and extending that, uh, that, that forward. So um, we will be launching into an orbit and, and, and then eventually getting into an orbit that's very, very close to Jason 3 within our, our goal is to get within 30 seconds of, of basically uh, uh, the Jason 3 satellite. And then once we're in orbit and we have our instruments turned on, we'll be able to uh, compare and cross calibrate that, that uh, data back again to, to Jason 3 very quickly. It's our best source of, of truth and comparison. So that's, uh, that's, the, that's the plan. Thank you so much, Parag. We are all very excited and eager to anticipation for tomorrow. Now, thank you to all of you who called in, both on our media line and also in our social media questions. And thank you so much for all of our panelists who joined us here today. The U.S. European Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich satellite will launch from Vandenberg Air Force Base tomorrow morning at 9.17 a.m. Pacific time. So make sure you tune into NASA TV for that. For more information on the satellite, 
website, go to www.nasa.gov slash Sentinel-6. You can also follow us on all social media platforms at NASA Earth to keep up with this mission and all of the Earth missions that we are a part of. Thanks so much for joining us today at NASA Earth Science. Your home is our mission. Thank you for watching.